so this is the third uh pass more passing on pass more podcast give myself a mouthful there uh, number three with oliver baines who's very kindly agreed to talk to me we have limited time which is going to make it really good and really speedy uh and we haven't had a lot of time to pre-chat which i like really so first of all is hello oliver thank you for coming hello on. joe lovely <laughs> to be here obviously <laughs> and your um, own company <laughs> Yeah, and I, so I met you when you were CEO of Cornwall Community Foundation, and then I heard about you from a very close friend who um, is an Extinction Rebellion, and actually quite amusingly, when you try to Google you, you get the thing about Parliament, but um, yes. Yes. <laughs> that's the first thing that comes up, it's quite entertaining, um, but uh, so which, what inspires you? Just, I try to sort of situate people. So if you want to say a little bit about yourself, just a short introduction and what inspires you. Yeah, so so I I guess I've been involved in this sort of stuff all my life, really, on the, on the side of other things. So I've had a kind of normal career when you said you'd seen me in you know, various different places over the years. And, but but the, the kind of the whole kind of nature and climate crisis issue has always been there in the back of my mind. So, uh, you know, I stopped flying in 1999. So it's like, even then, 30 years ago, I was already aware of what was going on. But the the, the thing that made me drop everything else and get involved, actually it wasn't, it, I mean, I could call it an inspiration, but it was a, it was actually a moment of terror for me. So we live in this, we live in this, this wonderful place, okay? We, we live a place called Trenoth, and we're in the Fowl Valley. We've got uh, uh, fields which run up as flood meadows up the valley, and on the side of the valley, steep-sided, you know, proper steep-sided Cornish Valley, uh, we've got uh, traditional oak woodlands, and across the top, we've got viaduct, the mainline viaduct from Penzance to London. Underneath the viaduct, I keep my vegetable garden, and every spring, I'm out there in the vegetable garden. And in the first week of May, every single year, the swifts arrive and they tear down the valley under the viaduct, screeching as they come. And it's like this kind of, look out, everybody, we're back. You know, it's this amazing, amazing occasion. And for me, it's the moment of the year when I understand our connection with the whole of the natural world in the whole of the globe. Yeah, because because they come from sub-Saharan Africa. They made that journey just to come back to see me in Tremont. <laughs> <laughs> Under the viaduct. <laughs> Under the viaduct. And we have, by the end of the summer, we have between 25 and 30 of them. But those numbers are declining. And I, what terrified me was the thought that I because I take personal responsibility and my generation on this globe have created the conditions where a bird which has been here for 140 million years could be extinct, could be wiped off the face of the map. And that was such a terrifying thought for me. And, and I thought, you know, you can see me, I'm white, middle-aged, middle-class. I've had, you know, I've had all the privileges that, 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 you know my our position in society brings us and with those privileges comes a responsibility and that responsibility is to husband what we have around us and we've utterly failed so so it's not an they're both an inspiration and a source of terror um, but that's what made that's what made me decide to get really involved that's why i joined actually i joined rising up just before extinction rebellion that was in like summer of 2018, rising up kind of morphed into Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And I went to the first, the first XR meeting I went to in, in Falmouth, which was, I thought it was going to be six Cornish nationalists in the front room. And it turned out to be about 120 people from all over Cornwall who can't, who'd answered the call to arms from XR, said like, we need to be out there. This is our moment. And it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. And, and you know, many of the people that you and I know were there yeah. and, uh, and became very involved with Extinction Rebellion as a result. And 
and formed a, a further, a, that was a source of inspiration for me to see so many people understanding that so many people were in a, in a state of horror at what was happening and also determination to take action. Now that action has gone in lots of different directions and I expect we'll talk about that. But for me, it's the political end. That's where I feel all the decisions get made. You know, there's a bunch of people sitting in London, sitting in Washington, sitting in Egypt last week, finding whatever way they can to protect all the fantastic luxuries and privileges that they have and resisting us at every point. And that's what interests me. And it's like, how, where's the chink? Where's the chink in their armour? Because there bloody well is one. I know yeah. there is one. Yeah. We've just got to find it. Yes. And you just have to keep going for it, don't you? I absolutely you adore yeah. William Wilberforce because they found the weirdest chink for the anti-slavery. But you just have to keep going, don't you? Yeah, you don't know where it's going to come from. It, and it comes left field. It doesn't yeah. come. It's never in the centre. It's like where you're pushing, yes. you get that resistance all the time. You know, you know, it's like you will not find it there. But as a result of you doing that, somewhere else, somebody goes, oh, I get to open this window here. Yes, yes. And I liked, um, so you sent me an article and you said that um, the thing about Martin Luther King, you know, I've been up the mountain. And I've seen a vision. It's that thing, isn't it, of, of a vision of something else. So you sort of, you have, you've yeah. answered that inspiration. And it's such a wonderful thing, isn't it, to grow up in Cornwall? It's just, a, it's such a privilege, yeah. and a blessing to be close yeah. to nature, to see all that. Um, and so I think it sort of says what you do now. Do you want to say a little bit more about what you're doing now? Because Extinction Rebellion has has grow, has spread, hasn't it? Those Those sort of responses have spread. Is that relevant, do you think? I, I yes. So, so what's interesting is is that if you take Extinction Rebellion in 2018, 2019, uh, we we were following this this theory of change mm. um, of galvanizing three point five percent of the population, and the and the tactic was to get ourselves arrested yes. in a non-violent, completely non-violent way with full respect for other people and and we achieved i think xr i mean i was simply one of you know thousands one of thousands that's all i was but i think between the thousands of us we achieved fantastic things in 2019 but what we hadn't taken into account was the um was the power and the influence and the and the, I guess I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but the the, the focus mm. that the centres of power could bring to bear on finding ways of neutralising us, and and so the various the various methods which have been used by you know, the powers that be, whether it's refusing to arrest us, I mean I was you know in April this year I was glued onto the Lloyd's of London building. The police wouldn't arrest us, and Lloyds of London wouldn't give give them permission to arrest us. So we just came down glued on. I mean, it was like, come on, guys, something's going to arrest us around here. So anyway, so that was uh, part of our tactic was you know don't arrest them, um, and 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 also of course we know about the media and how they presented us as you know eco terrorists and all that stuff that goes on, which is. It's, I mean, is it part of a concerted campaign? Uh, I'm not here to answer that one. It's just what happens. Let's just take it. It's, that's what happens. Um, so I'm not particularly a conspiracist, but I think they all gather together in the same places and they all say the same things to each other. They create the same images of us between them. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, oh, yes, they're eco-terrorists, and somebody says they're tree huggers, and somebody says, you know, and so on. And, and it just creates this perception that... that that people follow because people will follow, won't they? They will follow the perception, and and it meant that XR needed to start adjusting its uh, adjusting its own approaches. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a lot of discussion, which I hadn't been part of in the last couple of years, about have we got the right approach? Should, you know, what should we be doing? And I think there's a, an appreciation at the beginning of this year that 
these small focused events will, won't won't achieve what we want them to achieve. What we need is a large body of people to challenge government, and that's that's the um, that's the that's the process that we're following at the moment. Where we've done we've we've stopped doing disruptive activities which disrupt the general public because our we've been listening we we've, we've had tens of thousands of conversations on the doorstep so we've been listening to what people have to say to us we haven't been out there to preach and mm -hmm. say you want to join us we've been out there to say we want to know where you stand on this we want you to tell us what your views are what you think of the climate crisis what you think of the government's response to it what you think of xr and and we are here to listen we're not here to tell you anything we're here to listen and it's had an amazing effect so incredibly galvanizing effect mm -hmm. People who are who previously I think would have been very unsympathetic towards us have understood that we're ordinary people like them with a passion, yeah. and and they've understood that actually when they start to talk about their fears about the climate crisis, they have to be the same as ours. We're actually in the same place together. I I mean I had a chart that actually came through this morning from a Cornish group where they they'd done this they'd had a um, uh, like a display up and on the display they've had you know what how serious do you think the climate crisis is on, on a scale of one to ten and one at the bottom was don't give a damn and one at the top was i'm terrified and they're all the different stages in between and you put a dot you mm. put a dot on where you where you feel your own emotion you are emotionally and a few scatters all the way up and then this great mass great mass around the word terrified and that's what's happened this year. That's the move that's taken place this year. And I was saying to a group of people um, at the beginning of this week, the way I look on this is that um, at the beginning of the year, people would say to us, oh, you're XR, you're those people who block motorways, I don't want to talk to you. By April, they were saying, ah, oh, you're XR, I don't like that you block those motorways, but I understand what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sympathetic what you're trying to do. By October, they were saying, ah, you're XR, you're doing a great job. Although I don't much like that motorway stuff. Yes. So that shift, yeah. that's a really, in one year, that's an incredibly dramatic shift. And that's why I think we are set fair for our aim, which is to get at least 100,000 people onto the streets of London in April next year and staying there and staying there. Whether we're, the, the way in which that quite works has, hasn't been decided yet, but we need enough people so that they're safe and we need enough people so that government has to listen to us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is like a big, yeah. a really big one for us. It's like, we haven't done this before. We've, we've done much smaller actions and you know, it's like we've focused on whether it's kind of Barclays or HSBC yes. or the oil companies or whatever it is. Um, but this is government. And for me personally, government is where it is. Yeah. That's where it is. That's why, why, why are there so many oil company lobbyists around government? Because it's government where the decisions get made. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. No, no. <laughs> No, great, because I'm a real ranter. So that's why I just, I like this because I let other people rant instead of me. Um, Super. I know. I, and I, I, I don't know if I'll be there in April, but I definitely support it. Um, so the, the question is. We need how, you there, by the way. Pardon? We need you there. I know you do. <laughs> I, I'm a bit of a carer. So, um, but and we need everyone there, don't we? Um, so there's citizens assemblies, aren't there? Uh, and, and, and there's the call for that, which I understand. But if so, if you were a billionaire now, so the question, the passing on passing away thing, if you were a billionaire now, where would you put that energy, that um, funding to make something new happen? It could be something completely out the blue or whatever. What would you do? What do you think would make the most difference from the, from the, your vision of what's going on yeah. at the moment? I mean, I'm. I have to say, I'm kind of uncomfortable about the premise of this because I know. Go on. It, yes, I can understand it. <laughs> it doesn't quite flow. <laughs> so I, I've, 
you know, it's money that's brought us to this pass. Yes. You know. Is it yes. money that's going to get us out of it? I very, very much doubt. So. I think when I was, so, as I was about to say that to you, I was thinking it's not really what we're talking about, the money thing, because in a way it's like, what are the positive changes we need to make? Yeah, What's okay. the positive way? Because I agree with you. If you focus on money, right. it, it's just, it's small, isn't it? Well, right. yeah. Sorry, I just have to get rid of this. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, forget the money. Yeah. But where yeah. do you think we need to put our energy, our time? Obviously, in, in, in the government, in that in yeah. that sort of con contact with the government but how do you think a new future could be it's almost like what i want to get from people okay. Okay. what would okay. a new what would a good future look like a good yeah future? yeah, yeah. You know. yeah so, so let's forget let's forget the billionaire bit yeah, forget the money bit yeah the billionaires <laughs> have brought us to this place yeah. so yeah, forget yeah. them so this is for me is a completely kind of key element to this so so we know what's wrong mm. and we know about some of the mechanics but what we should do about it, you know. And but there's a for me, there's always a question that somebody will ask because we, you know, it's like the world that we'd love to see is a world that's filled with love and compassion and respect and you know and appreciation and and humility and you know all the virtues that we ascribe to. But somebody will always say to me or say to you. Yeah, but that doesn't put food on the table for my kids. What will put the food on the table for my kids? And I think that's the key question we have to find the answer to. And the, the difficulty at the moment is that we we keep coming back to, to like the mechanics of the system mm. because that's what people want us to concentrate on. So we immediately start talking about, you know, going off grid or renewable energy or, you know, jobs in renewable energy or whatever it might be, something mm. like that. So I was thinking the other day, I was thinking, supposing you, you know, we, we've got this, this world that we, that we can picture, this really beautiful, colourful world that we can picture. And how do we transition from where we are to there and bring people with us? Because we've got to bring everybody with us. And I was thinking you, you can take it in, in a stage, a transitional stages. So I think one of our, yeah, it's probably a weakness to, to try and get to the end right right at the beginning. Yes. It's like, yeah. That's where we want to, that's the so goal. The that's the goal. Yeah. And here's some steps along the way. Yeah. So so if we take something which is everybody talks about now, which is at the moment, which is transport. Mm -hmm. Right. So the the initial reaction is, you know, we want fewer private cars, more public transport. But okay, so hang on, how are we going to make this work? If we if we invest in public transport at the moment. What that'll mean in a place like Cornwall is we just have lots of empty buses running the, running the place. We need to do much more than simply invest in public transport. So, so we've got this very exciting technology developing about driverless cars. So it's quite possible that within a few years from now, let's say five years, if driverless cars become, become authorised, and they should do at any moment, once they're authorised, you can simply go on your phone, say, I want a car and I want it here in 20 minutes. I want it to take me to wherever I want to go to. You know, my children to school, me to the shops, me to work, whatever it is. Why would you need a car? Why would you need a car in that, that situation where for most people in the country, you can simply dial up for a car and you can pay 20 pence a mile or 10 pence a mile because there's no driver. So, so you immediately change the terms of engagement with the, between the individual and the motor car. Once we, so, so rather than having however many millions, let's say we've got 30 million cars on the roads, I don't know what the figure is, but it's probably something around there, that would fall straight back to about 5 million because, because you actually only use your car for 10% of the time, 5% of the time, you know, so you don't need the car, get rid of the car. You dial up for when you want to live. So, so that's creating all sorts. So, first of all, you've got a lot of people put out of work. You know, what about taxi drivers? That sort of thing. So they get transferred into the new into the, like Green New Deal stuff. So that deals with that stage of the transition. But you still have to deal with the fact that you've still got a large number of cars around and a lar and a very large public transport network, which emits large amounts of CO2. So, so the next stage is 
that you know i mean we don't have the answer to this, but it's like you look at that as being transition stage number one transition stage number two is right okay we need everybody to relocalize completely so or everything that you need is within your within your neighborhood the things that you want can be outside mm -hmm. and that's when you might need your driverless car to get you to what you want rather than to what, you, what need. you need yes and, then, and you know and then you you can start to create create an image of quite a kind of modern society because that's what people want yeah it's quite a modern society but completely localized mm -hmm. and not atomized yes like society is at the moment so you've already got a benefit from it you've got the health benefit you've got the you've got the pollution benefit from not having the cars you've got the health benefit from not having the pollution you know so and 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 you know it's like it's a plus 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 and you just build on it as you go yes but yes. that's that's for somebody who says how am i going to put the food on the table for my kids you can say well actually there are lots in the new industry there are lots of jobs in that industry because it opens up all sorts of opportunities we can't see at the moment but there will be hundreds of opportunities and of course there is a whole new economy to be imagined and then implemented and that will require lots of people to support it and then because you're doing everything locally well actually there'll be lots of jobs locally because you'll be trying to grow your vegetables locally etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. so you can see it you can see these stages forming between where we are now and where we need to be yes yes as long as the politicians don't get in the way well, and, I guess um, it, it's positive systems change, isn't it? I really, you know, that, that's what I was going around for a long time saying, you know, we need positive systems change. And I think yeah. when I came across Donut Economics, I just loved it because it puts people and their needs, not their wants, people and their needs in it, and then the earth and its needs. And you can't make a decision, you shouldn't make a decision for one without considering the other and considering the roll on effects. So it's a lot about thinking about our own ecosystem, isn't it? And that we are part of that ecosystem. So keeping those systems healthy, yeah. when we make those decisions. Yes, uh, and yeah, and I, I'm not, okay, so, so, so you know, we're looking at this from our very privileged position in the Western world, in a beautiful corner of it. Yeah. Whereas in Pakistan or wherever it might be, you know, like this great swathe around the globe they're right in the middle of a catastrophe and 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 a discussion about driverless cars with them is utterly meaningless isn't it yes. so so i it, for me i i feel that we need those conversations with other cultures other races other points of view is completely essential to this and it's like it's like why why should we allocate these privileges to ourselves of having this wonderful world that we're designing when i mean it can't operate can it i mean it can't it's immoral for us to have a wonderful world when other people live in poverty and starvation i mean it's like it's yes. just immoral. i think one of the things that makes me really sad is that you know in the war and things like that people say you know we're doing this you're, you're having rationing you're doing these things for the effort you know yeah. for the greater good and I believe you know, there's a thing called the Common Cause Foundation. And I do believe that if you appeal to people's greater good, people have done service, people want to do the greater good. So if you say like, you, you know, we're not going to make your lives miserable, but you're going to have less, but you're going to have less because others are going to have more. So, you know, yeah. and we're going to try and rebalance things. I think people are appealed to in that way. And I think that we think that people are far more selfish and self-centered than they are. And that's that's a lot of the critique of, of how things are sort of shown in the press and everything, that actually people are far more considerate and caring. And it's how to it, it's how to sort of galvanize that in a way. Yeah, and it's the getting away from I mean, we've had this thrust about the preeminence of the of the individual probably for 500 years, but it's it's actually you know the whole kind of neoliberal economic theory is about the individual in the marketplace and and the individual as a as a as an autonomous entity isn't it which is just That's a not, lie it's, it's just, just a lie it's, it's just ridiculous. a complete lie and, and both <laughs> both the people before you have have said you know that 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 is ridiculous and the last person i talked to jamie moran it was a lot about actually it's it's not in it's not individualism and it's not collectivism but that third way of patrick geddes and that um, it's about people and community 
and it's mm. and, and holding that sort of slight tension between what I want and what's good for the community and actually allowing it to be a bit of a tension because it's a creative tension that creates the best yeah. for both and you yeah. don't have to yeah. go one way or the other I think people always want to have this very dualistic it's right it's wrong it's good it's bad whereas actually it, it's it's up for discussion and collaboration isn't it yeah. and, he and I love the I love the image of the edge I think the edge is the most exciting place always to be isn't it and it's it's like you know we look at it in nature and it's like why are organic farmers so you know where's the most exciting place on the farm it's the bit where the field butts up to the woods woods yes. you know it's always it's where the where the pond and the area and the area around it, the area of woodland around the pond that little bit is you know like that's why you get the biodiversity that's why you get the excitement it's, it's like of course of course that has to be our focus it's like looking at what happens in the bit in between everything else because that's that's the creative bit and I, and i think having mentioned the word creative i think that you know we talk about this we talk about these things in a, in a like an intellectual way but actually the the absolute key to making this a success is creativity and culture it's not it's not mechanics you know it's it's not it's not academic argument it's creativity and culture I was I was reading a very interesting article, I can't find it there, but about somebody and he said that what we've squashed, and I have a lot of critiques of the education system, but he said what we've squashed is imagination. And it's like, and I think in the way that's what these conversations, how can we imagine a better world? Because if we can imagine it, then yeah. it can happen. You know, yeah. it can happen. And we have to use our imagination in that positive way and our creativity to, to because, yeah, that, that's the way you get through problems, isn't it? That's the way you find solutions. Well, if you think of the, I mean, I, I do XR as an example. Actually, you think of what happened in 2019 and the sheer, the sheer kind of the zest of creativity that was in that. That's what it made it different to every other climate protest that had ever been. Suddenly, people were looking at it and thinking, oh, "This looks like real fun. You know, this is nice. This is good. It's colourful. There's things going on. It's like lots of different types of activity." There. You know, people, that's some people over there dancing. You know, it's a climate crisis and people are dancing. Uh, well, why would you not dance in a climate crisis? If it's so serious, you have to dance. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like being, being a paramedic. I mean, if a paramedic walks around being visible all the time, they're not going to be a paramedic for very long. It's the way in which you manage a situation which is so terrifying. Mm. Of course, you know, if you're at war, what you know? What do people do when they're at war? You know, they have lots of parties, don't they? I mean, it's like that's what they do. Yeah, and you crack a lot of bad jokes. You know, crack a lot of bad jokes. A lot of bad jokes <laughs> to get yourself through it all. No, I really, um, I, I was very impressed when Extinction Rebellion came along because I'd been in a lot of political rallies when I was younger, and and you know, it was always angry. And it was always antagonistic. Yeah. It was always angry, and it was always us and them, and that never really works. It's not. It's no, not no. going to make real change when you make yeah. somebody into the enemy. You know, you have to sort of. That's a, that whole communication. I think is really impressive. Yeah, yeah. So do I. So do I. So so you know, where do we take it from here? What do we? Do, what is it that we should be doing now? And I and I think one of the amazing things about about uh, that like this community of people who are this enormous actually enormous community of people who are really terrified about the about the crisis is if you look at that part of the community that is in cornwall there's a, a enormous amount going on i mean i'm just staggered at the amount that's happening and it's like and it's happening almost like like it's like a like osmosis it's like spreading through all of the community of cornwall mm -hmm. and you know, I would say that some of the most surprising things that have happened to me have been talking on the doorstep with communities that we've deliberately decided to talk to because we think they're unsympathetic or unempathetic un to us. And having conversations on the doorstep in those places that have been incredibly uplifting because people have said, I'm, oh, I was about to swear. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what they said. Let's yes, walk. Yeah, they said, you know, I'm fucking furious. That the, yeah. That's what they say, yes. and 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 they want action, and they want themselves to be part of that action. And they want the solution to be their solution, and they, and then and their community's solution, their neighbourhood's solution, 
and I, you know, and I see some of the climate action that's taking place in Cornwall. I just think it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And that, and that many of those are people who've been, some of them are people who've been involved in like the environmental movement over the years. Um, but many are completely new to it. They just, well, many of them are straight out of school or university. Of course, they just thought we need to deal with this. Let's go on with it. Yes, well, like the students at Falmouth University, and I actually stood on the streets with the dotty chart um, in Falmouth um, a while ago. Oh, did you? Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Because I, I couldn't quite do the door to door, but I could do the asking people that came by because you could sort of register who wanted to talk to you or not. And yes. I think, um, okay, yes. Yeah, and no, yeah. I think it's, it, it is important, and it, yes, it's, well, it, I, it is changing. It, so I was, I was saying to uh, Rose, my partner, just before this, because I, had that that picture of the strip that had come just come in i said the thing about that is those are not those people who put their dots on the word terrified they're not members of extinction rebellion no. they're ordinary members of the public walking past being given a dot because they put it where you want to and yeah. they put it there they all put it there yeah. and yeah. i think that for me that's really important is it that that people had a choice they could put it wherever they wanted. Yeah. They could stop and talk to you. They cannot. I think it was also an invitation for people to go along to a meeting and a talk. And I, I and I think it is extraordinary because what's happened since 2019 is it's come into it's come in, into the dialogue and it, it, it's landed, hasn't it? It's part of our conversations yeah. now. Yeah. Because around, I think it was about 2019, I remember talking, some of the people came into Shalal and were going like, oh, we went, you know, this, this march started at Land's End. And I sort of looked around the group and everyone was sort of quietly nodding. And I said, well, OK, so, you know, this is a really mixed bag of people. And we don't often talk about things. We didn't at that time when we talk about things like that. I said, so who um, knows someone in Extinction Rebellion or is in it? And I tell you, three quarters of the group put their hands up. So, oh, really? yeah. yes, but I think, yeah. yeah, so it's just it's really interesting. And, and I wish it. Yeah, I hope it all goes well. So. Citizens assemblies. Oh yes, okay. Action. I mean, what else do you think? What do you think can help us into this positive systems change? What yeah. do we do? You know, there's April, yeah. but we need to keep banging on about it. Obviously, people need to keep acting, so that well, at some point this little chink that we don't know where it's going to come, but this little chink is going to open, so things will actually yeah. change. But what so, do you so I, I think the citizens' assemblies are, uh, are really interesting in a number of different ways. I mean, first and directly, it's because it is about participatory democracy. And if we're going to find a way through, this looks like a very attractive mechanism for doing so, a mm. process that we can use. It is only a process, yes. it's not an end. No. And, I, and I think we, we, we need to beware feeling that if we get citizens assemblies we sorted it no we haven't what we sorted out is a is a way of of drawing in the all the intelligence that we have around us about this particular subject and some recommendations coming back to us which we might which might improve the situation i think it's a mistake to think that if we have a citizens assembly, we will resolve it. I, I also think we have to be aware that probably only 5% of the population have any idea at all what a citizens assembly is. Yes, well, and I that, had to look it up a while ago, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, I, I'm encouraged by my, by my own thought that probably if you ask people in 1890 what they thought about universal suffrage, they probably looked at you completely blankly and said I have no idea what you're talking about and yet 30 years later we had universal suffrage so so this can you know if uh, uh, if, a, if a new idea if it catches on it can it can gain credence very very quickly can't it it can become part of the mainstream very quickly yes um, I think one of the things I'm thinking about as, as we're talking that over that bit was how do we, you know, sometimes you go around the internet or something, you come across, you know, somebody advertises, I found this wonderful solution to this, and this wonderful solution mm. to that. And you're going like, so there probably are out there some really great solutions to a lot of the problems we've got. They're not funded, coming back to the money thing again a bit, but they're not funded by government. So they're not developed, they're not rolled out, they're not overly tested. So I suppose it would also be for me, it's like, if we're going to find these solutions, locals important, 
you know, better democracy, citizens' assembly is important, but also gathering the intelligence and testing out, like you're talking about, you know, driverless cars or something, testing out systems that are going to work. How do we, how do we gather that in a way? Well, yes, we need to do modeling, don't we? And yeah. then modeling, modeling costs money. You need teams yes. of experts to do modeling. And it, but, but I also think, you know, d trial and error is, yes. as, you know, there's nothing wrong with trial and error. And it's like, we've, we're, we're in this kind of sophisticated, so-called sophisticated, society where where you know every everything is everything is planned to the nth degree and actually some of this it'll just happen it'll just happen won't it and I, and I think that's why why we have to keep focusing on culture and yes and creativity because because the, those flowers will bloom they will bloom as soon as you give them a chance it's like once we start pushing the edge a little yes. bit further out you know, but we do have, you know, what, however we look at it and however you know, imp impressive the, the current moves are to localism in all its different forms, we still have this kind of gargantuan economic and political structure which is imposing itself on us. And, you know, it's like we, you know, we are faced with large numbers of, of uh, protesters being criminalized as a result of the latest measures, you know, the, the latest measures to suppress us. I mean, it's like, it's a complete outrage. The whole thing is, is appalling. And, and people are, you know, people even now are being held on remand who should never be near a prison gate. You know, it's like, it's just not acceptable. But the powers, the, these, this great structure that we have thinks it can impose itself on all of us. And we have, so we have to deal, we still have to deal with that. Yes. And I think, I think one of the best critiques I've heard, which isn't too aggressive, is that it's just out of date. It's seriously out of date and, yeah. and it's behind the times and it's not fit for purpose. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, let's just, you know, let's just accept that and let's try and move forwards because it is the, it's the old guard. Yes. And the thing about the old guard is they have all the power, they have all the levers of power, don't they? They've got everything. Everything they think they have everything on their side. It's at that point that they're most vulnerable because they've got furthest to fall. And if you can just find the right brick to pull out from our edifice, the whole lot will come tumbling down. But then we have to work out, you know, before we pull that brick out, we need to be thinking about how do we organize ourselves when all of that comes tumbling down? Because that, I think that's what my question is of what these questions yeah. are about, really. Um, you know, yeah. forget hooking it onto money, but it's like because I, I can't but see and I don't want to be too depressive about it but I can't but see that at some point it we're going to have these awful sort of gaping holes and difficulties well but they're all around the world anyway and it's like what do we do we've got to have some good things mm. ready to put into place it's no good turning around and going like well we knew it was going to happen because that's not what yeah. does that get you it's like what have we got in place so I think all those sort of local connections and people talking to each other and people beginning beginning to get good, pr healthy practices ready so they can roll out, you know, or at least they go yeah. like, well, there's a good idea over here that we could try, you know, like you're saying, we're not gonna get it right, but yeah. at least having some, some um, something in our arsenal, whatever you call it, something ready for it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not an intellectual, I'm not a philosopher, and I, I, I'm not an academic, but I look, at the, I look at what's happening now, and all the failures that you can see in the system at the moment, and it's a, like a bizarre situation to be in where you feel on the one hand that that, si that system has to be deconstructed. Yes. It's got to be deconstructed. Yes. At the same time, if that system falls over, it will take all of us with it. You know, it is an absolutely, so it's terrifying. It's a terrifying thought that it might continue. And it's a terrifying thought that it might not. <laughs> it's like, so, <laughs> I know, thanks, that's, Oliver. That's, 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 that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's that's yeah. why so many people are saying we need a plan. We need a plan. It's a plan that will get us through this. And it's like XR is kind of screaming from the rooftops at the moment, demanding a plan. It's a, you know, we say a plan using citizens' assemblies, but it's a plan to get us out of this bloody mess in a way that's just for everyone and just for all life on the planet. 
but it is a plan. That's what we haven't got. And they haven't got a plan because they're running around trying to, you know, it's like, it's like that, it's like this castle. They're running around trying to block up the holes and the battlements to make, make keep them strong. While the rest is kind of swirling around on the outside. And we're on the outside saying, you know, we need a plan to, we need a drawbridge. Yes. Did, we need you to drop the drawbridge, drawbridge so we can come in and talk to you about how we all of us get ourselves out of this mess. And actually, I'm really cross that I put I, that I put this article somewhere that I can't get an easy reach now because, um, no, I don't think I've got time. Um, he was saying that you know in Scandinavia people are, are happy to talk about planning for thirty to forty years time. That very much uh, we're very present tense in this culture at the moment, and that's really to our detriment. We're always yeah. sort of like, oh, well, we have to, you know, the cost of living crisis or the whatever crisis. But all those crises, you know, are, are a big are a bigger picture. They come from a long tradition of decisions, like you're saying that, and that, and they're going forwards into a long tradition ahead of us, which isn't looking good. Yeah. So we need to have that that yeah. yeah, yeah, ideas, yeah. You know. I mean I'm 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 a terrible like I'm a catastrophist so I'm like you know we need to act now we absolutely need to act sorry that's a farmer for you isn't it <laughs> if, the, if the crops are gonna fail they'll fail yeah the floods <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, floods today actually oh. and yeah um but I I mean I understand we need a hundred year plan We've got to have a one-year plan as well, I mean, or a ten-year plan, and a twenty. In the side, all of these, we need all of these plans because it's the only way we're going to find our way through it. It's like the mess is too big, and actually, what we need is separate plans for different parts of the mess, so we can sort. You know, someone was talking about that on something I went to the other day, and I was very impressed by it actually. And they had a great word for it, which of course I can't remember, but it was about that you need a plan for your locality. It's yeah. very much, you know, that it, it, it's a it, it's a geography centered thing that, you know, if you're yeah. talking about localization and yeah. you're talking about what you grow or how people are, actually, that's probably only about 10, 20 miles around you, isn't it? Especially yeah. in Cornwall, because we're so in some places it could be hundreds. But for us, our geography changes yeah. so quickly. So yeah. actually, that's our community. That's the thing that we need to hold and cherish the the biodiversity and all of that in those yeah. places. Um, yeah. Okay, I run out of ideas then. Well, not ideas. I run out of how to express it all. Oh my! Um, <laughs> I'm sure you've probably you probably have about another fifteen questions, and I've got about another three minutes. No, I think that's absolutely fine because really, it, it is just I want to discuss this question with people. That that is yeah, the question, yeah. and, and I the, agree with you. You know, yeah. the great thing is, in the end, we all find ourselves in the same place, don't we? Then we, you know, that's this like common humanity between all of us who care who care about common humanity yes. we all find ourselves in the same place and and it's and so the final my final thought i want to go back because i think my final thought would be would be for all the imagination that we're, that that's being you know what we're benefit, benefiting from now how do we translate that in ways which is useful to people who are in much in much greater peril than we are. I mean, our peril is coming up, but other people's peril is on them now. Yes. And, and I, I, I just, I just feel where we we haven't made those links. We're not very good. We're not very good at talking. Yes. The people who have very very different life experiences um I, I i sit on sometimes on culture declares emergency conversations and they talk a lot about the global south you know and, yeah. and all, all the countries that aren't included in, in lots of the conferences and who are experiencing climate change now and who don't have a voice and the indigenous people that don't have a yeah. voice yeah. so the people that are disempowered really um so it is it's interesting not, that, but i mean just stop that for a minute because you know what an insult what an affront it is to to people that those people most affected by the crisis are, their voices are not heard and those people who are who who are benefiting most from the crisis are those people whose voices are heard i mean what an insult that is all those oil lobbyists at cop 27 you know and those indigenous people cop 27 should be run by the indigenous people and they should be telling us what we need to do you know um, in, instead in of which is 
in, in, well, in my practice, in my practice in how I was trained, which is only in dance, but it was an extraordinary model for humanity, was the person who is most vulnerable is at the centre. Yeah. You do. Yeah. The person who's most fun, and I still believe this, this is my model about society, really, and I've carried it with me since my teens, and I'm becoming more active around sort of global crisis now, because I've seen systems change for people who were um, in lockup hospitals, but it's changed within individualization in a capitalist system. So yeah. they then have lost community. So that is that thing of that people and community that you have to hold both. But also the other thing was, um, is that you have to have the most vulnerable people at the heart of your community. Now people sort of get that with children, but it's like they don't do that about people who are very vulnerable. You know, the old get sidelined, people with, with high levels of support needs get sidelined. And it's the same way in a way we're doing in a bigger scale in the globe. The people who you can't see, who don't speak out much, well, we just ignore them. And that's why so, we need, it's not a system change we need, it's a culture change we need. It's a culture change, it's that's all of it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's a culture change of care, of care, really. I see it as a culture change of care on a global scale, really. Yeah. Because, and, yeah. I, and for me, it's like, when I saw good care, to, to have good care for the person who's vulnerable to be well cared for, the person who's caring for them has to be well cared for. And so it ripples out into the whole. It's like if you have that good culture of care, it actually ripples out that each person feels validated, cared for, heard. And in a sense, that's what we need, isn't it? In a sense. Lovely. That's yeah, a lovely whatever. point. There you go. That's a lovely point to end on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you. It's been great. It's been lovely talking to you. And uh, we'll catch up again soon. I'm sure we'll take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.